Good afternoon, everyone, um, and welcome to today's briefing on sanctions compliance, a topic that I know all of you are living 24 seven. We're really pleased to have with us today, Dan Tannenbaum, who leads Oliver Wyman's anti-financial anti crime practice for the Americas and serves as the firm's global head of sanctions. Dan is a true expert in this area, advising banks and broker dealers, including many IIB members, on AML and sanctions compliance, and he has government clients as well. Dan's insights are particularly valuable to IIB members because of his in-house and government service. He previously served as the head of compliance for the Americas and Global Sanctions Champion at TravelX, so he knows your pain <laughs> and was the OFAC compliance coordinator for the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, where he advised on OFAC issues, having previously served as a compliance officer with OFAC at Treasury. We're really fortunate to have him here with us today. I think his TV gigs alone are a full-time job. So I really encourage you to take advantage of having Dan by asking questions using the Q&A icon or the chat function. I know there's a lot to cover. So Dan, I'm just going to say thank you again and turn it over to you. Oh, thank you, Bridget. And, and again, appreciate the opportunity to be back in front of the IIB. It's been a number of years and, and to Bridget's kind intro. Pre-COVID, I spent most of my time overseas with a number of your organizations and their head offices across Europe, the Middle East, and, and Asia. So it's a, particularly a community that I've spent quite a lot of time with. Just to, to emphasize again, feel free to ask questions through the Q&A or whatever other mechanism exists to do that. Um, you know, as we all know, this is a, a pretty rapidly changing landscape with an interesting GL that even dropped less than an hour ago from OFAC that kind of sends some some mixed messages about what the US is looking at. Uh, but with that, if we go ahead a few slides um, and go to slide seven, just kind of laying out where are we and, and kind of what is the environment that exists today? Because it's hard to talk rush without really looking at, at what is the landscape more broadly that, that exists around sanctions. Now, first and foremost, we, we've seen a return to multilateralism. Um, sanctions have a, a mixed track record at best of success. The unilateral sanctions that were traditionally imposed by the Trump administration were largely ineffective. Um, we see the Biden administration bringing back a lot of old hands from prior administrations um, and, and really resume, as we've seen no greater example than what's happening in Ukraine and the Russian reaction from a sanction standpoint, that, that multilateral approach to sanctions. Um, we're obviously, while all of the focus or most of the focus is on Ukraine and the response against Russia, there are still attempts to restart the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action that was abandoned by the Trump administration in 2018. I forget how many rounds of talks, I think it was seven or eight rounds of talks since last year in Vienna. Um, supposedly uh, the US and Iran are close. It was announced yesterday that the US was not going to drop the IRGC from the state spot, from a list of terrorist organizations, um, really trying to manage some of the fallout on that topic. But it is really a big question in terms of whether the JCPOA will go ahead. It's not necessarily a coincidence though, when you begin to look at the reduction in usage of Russian oil, of what that means if you allow Iranian oil back onto the open market as well. We've also seen similar talks with Venezuela to begin to gradually release some of the sanctions on them. Now, UK and EU sanctions have continued to take on a more prominent role around the world. EU sanctions have really picked up steam as EU is leading the world in sanctions relative to Russia that we'll get into. Um, and obviously, looking at the current crisis in Ukraine, 
Um, we've never seen such a significant economy be subject to such a comprehensive set of sanctions at, at such speed. And the word unprecedented gets batted around a lot, but it is kind of appropriate if you think about what it is that we're really engaged with. Now, if you go to the next slide, let, let's talk about Russia sanctions pre-2022. Um, you know, I was with a member of Congress yesterday who pretty openly said, and I can't attribute because it was in a non-public forum, that the American government response to Crimea was perhaps one of the worst ever in the history of the government, essentially ceding Crimea to Russia with that annexation in 2014 and the establishment of sectoral sanctions. Um, I think when you begun to look at, at Russia coming back into focus of sanctions with that annexation of Crimea, um, the sanctions, as we saw, were most heavily focused on, on debt or equity restrictions on only a handful of companies, but the overwhelming majority of commerce between Russia, the US, and the West um, was largely free and open. Now, in early September of 2020, sanctions were levied related to election interference from um, an alleged spy serving in the Ukrainian government. We saw sanctions levied related to the poisoning of Alexei Navalny. Um, you began to see further sanctions, uh, or at least the threat of sanctions, related to the completion of Nord Stream 2. That really dragged on for quite a while. Sanctions related to election meddling, further rounds of sanctions related to Navalny's imprisonment. But really, none of these were that significant. Um, now, we saw I guess it was last year, we did see an attempt previously of Russian forces building up at the Ukrainian border with a threat of sanctions driving them back to Russia. And obviously, as we moved into this current crisis that's now been going on for over three months, the threat of sanctions clearly weren't enough. Um, now, if you go to the next slide and, and really beginning to talk about what has happened and I think the Peterson Institute has a, a really good timeline of different events that I've collapsed into this form here. You know, for about two-ish months, two to three months, you had a fairly robust multilateral deterrence campaign, if you will, as Russia was beginning to build up forces again on the Ukrainian border, there were a number of telegraph threats of sanctions that were constantly being dropped by the US and its allies around the world. Um, and again, in a fairly multilateral fashion, um, as we've begun to see this campaign play out. Um, again, sanctions were sanctions were threatened, but again, it, it didn't really move the needle. Um, you saw, I guess, just in the days prior to the invasion, you saw the um, kind of Russia's announcement of I want to get the phrasing right, essentially the legitimacy of the Donetsk and Luhansk regions um, of Ukraine in so much as, you know, they are able to govern themselves. Um, and, and that was one of the earlier salvos that resulted in some preliminary sanctions before the, the Russian invasion actually occurred. Um, that announcement, um, recognizing the independence and sovereignty of the regions, happened the day after the Winter Olympics concluded, which everyone really was beginning to wonder how this would play out with Beijing hosting the Winter Olympics and Putin not wanting doing, to do anything to really interrupt what uh, she was trying to host. Now, in response to that decree, and again, it, it didn't really do anything but acknowledge what Russia's view was on, on that territory, the Biden administration imposed an executive order stopping new investment into the region. And again, not necessarily the most significant action um, that, that could have taken place. Now, that was on February 21st. Now, you had a few more days of, of additional sanctions that were imposed pre-invasion. On February 22nd, Olaf Schultz announced that Germany has suspended the certification of Nord Stream 2, essentially ending Nord Stream 2. On the 23rd, the EU announced a significant package of sanctions against Russia, but mostly focused on the Donetsk and Luhansk regions, as well as some asset freezes related to Russian individuals. And then on February 24th, Russia began invading. Um, and we did begin to see a swift response in the form of sanctions against some of the larger financial institutions. Um, 
asset freezes against state-owned businesses, the beginnings of oligarch sanctions. Um, and within that same day, you saw the UK, Canada, Australia, and not the EU, a number of other allies begin to impose large-scale sanctions on the Russian government and on Russian businesses. But that wasn't deterring. Um, but that wasn't deterring uh, Russian forces in Ukraine. You began to see a further escalation on February 28th in the form of seizing of, of Russian sovereign of Russian central bank assets held around the world. Now th this was one of the more significant steps taken uh, in the early days to, to really try and, and strike at the heart of the Russian government in trying to limit their ability to transact worldwide. But when you begin to unpack kind of what happened within the first week of sanctions, you had oligarch sanctions, you had banking restrictions, you had Russian central banking assets were seized. Um, you had the Russian central bank itself designated, um, which had only happened to, to one other central bank in history. You began to see threats of banning companies from accessing SWIFT. And you actually began to see a heavy dose of self-sanctioning, which you can really call de-risking beginning, starting with Shell, uh, which seeing the oil sector, the energy sector, um, be one of the first sectors to, to announce that they were voluntarily leaving the market was fairly significant. Um, now, we have had at last count, I think if you begin to look globally, but 150-ish discrete actions from the US, EU, UK, Switzerland, uh, countries across Asia, in terms of further trying to impose sanctions uh, on Russia in an attempt to drive Russia out of Ukraine. Now, I think the punchline here is, is you know, Russia was bombing uh, Ukrainian cities, ultimately found to be killing civilians, and the Western response was largely driven, at least initially, by the imposition of sanctions before weapons and military support were provided to the Ukrainian government. Now, talking to a group of financial services organizations, I, I think it's important to note that financial services was perhaps the best equipped sector of any industry I've worked in to manage some of these sanctions challenges. Um, and while I know the first few weeks were hellacious for most of us in, in dealing in this space, um, it, it is important to note that the control framework that most banks operating in the US, most banks operating globally have put in place was really fit for purpose to take on some of these entities, these individuals, these practices that needed to be minded to ensure compliance with, with these growing sanctions around the world. I think one of the bigger challenges that we saw in the early days was largely kind of a slight disconnect between the sanctions imposed in different countries where you didn't have consistent guidance. Now, I know there's been questions throughout the last few months of, well, how organized is this? One day the US, the next day Japan, the next day Australia. That, that is part of an intentional campaign to keep Russia on its toes. If the world began to drop these packages like they did in 2014 with the sectoral sanctions and mass, um, you know, in this instance, Russia doesn't know when these rounds are over. Um, they don't know when the next country is going to impose sanctions against them. And so it really was an overt act to keep Russia in, in certain un, in uncertain times of knowing what was going to happen next. Now, we saw also in some of the early days, there was talk around cutting off all Russian banks from SWIFT. And, and one of the, the really important things to note, there's been talk over the last two months that Russia is the most sanctioned country in the world. Russia is not the most sanctioned country in the world. I think that that lend, that title really is held by Syria and then probably Iran after it. The amount of legal commerce that is still permitted between Russia and the West is fairly significant. There's a lot more business that's legally permissible than that which is banned through sanctions. And that was why that talk of de-swifting Russia was so nonsensical. If you think about it, even focus on energy transactions before there was at least some degree of a plan on how the world would treat Russian gas, Russian, Russian natural gas, Russian oil. 
um, the ability to finance the purchasing of that needed oil and gas was made through Russian banks. If you de-swifted them, it would have made it much more complicated to finance the purchasing of commodities that at least at that point were still needed in the winter months across Europe. So you kind of took SWIFT off the table, but when you begin to look at what is still out there, absent the designated financial institutions, and while there are a lot, there are still unsanctioned Russian banks, including one of the largest that, that's still a conduit for financing Russian energy transactions, there's still a lot of activity that you can that you can carry out. And it is one of the things that comes up in my discussions with a variety of, of governments. I, I meet regularly with folks in the Biden administration, in the UK government, in, with the European Commission. You know, the, the question really is remaining at this point, what are financial institutions doing with respect to their risk appetite in Russia? Even dealing with a domestic US bank last week that has corporate clients, American corporate clients continuing to trade with Russian businesses, they have no desire to suspend that business. Um, and the law doesn't oblige them to do that in so much as they're not dealing with, with certain sanctioned counterparties. And, and that is a bit of the inflection point we begin to find ourselves in. Um, if you look at the sanctions that have been imposed, while they are very significant, um, you know, the self-sanctioning, over a thousand large companies have pulled out of Russia. Jeff Sonnenfeld at, at Yale School of Management maintains what to me is really the definitive list of, of companies who have left Russia. The page has now flipped. It's focusing on companies that have not left Russia. And when you begin to look sectorally at which companies have remained in the market, financial services is kind of tops on that list. That The banks uh, operating in the region, operating with clients that operate in the region are, are about the least represented on, on that list, interestingly enough. Now, that can be done again, back to my earlier point, that banks know how to manage sanctions risk generally. So as long as you're following the letter of the law, as long as the law allows you to do certain things and you have the control framework to manage against that, you, know, you can do it. Now, as we're seeing coming up more and more, especially with the World Economic Forum meeting in Davos this week, you're seeing that blend of ESG come up as it relates to sanctions and, and the response to certain activities happening in Ukraine and continued support of Russia. And I do believe in the coming weeks, we are going to see more and more ties of an ESG agenda for an organization and layering on top whether or not they're continuing to perform business in, in Russia. It is one of those areas that when I talk to government officials, you know, their reaction is if you have clients still operating in Russia, still operating in business related to Russia, legal or otherwise, tell them to leave. And that's not necessarily the most helpful advice. I mean, if you want businesses to leave, order them out of the market from a sanction standpoint. And, and ironically, just an hour ago, General License 13A was dropped from OFAC which essentially extends the timeline for American businesses operating in Russia to legally pay any sort of taxes, fees, permits, certifications that they need to pay domestically on the ground in Russia to operate. So somewhat flies in the face of that message of get out if you're still allowing businesses to legally operate in the region. Now, if you go to the next slide, um, you know, again, just, just a double click. Now, by, by designations, Russia is the world's most sanctioned country. And it's an important moniker. A lot of entities, vessels, planes, people, um, but a lot of practices that are still permissible. This slide was updated a few weeks ago. So apologies if it's slightly out of date. As you all know, this has become nearly impossible to keep current. That chart on the left, um, courtesy of a firm called Castellum AI, really shows the different practices and who has sanctioned them around the world. So kind of the blue check marks indicate they haven't, or the green check marks announced sanctions have been imposed. Red check marks indicate sanctions have not been imposed. If you look at some of these lines in the sectors that have been touched upon, there's very few that universally have sanctions. I think one is restrictions on sovereign debt. Another are restrictions on the export of luxury goods to Russia. But with respect to Russian metal importation, Russian coal importation, obviously oil and gas, there is not universal alignment in some of these sanctions. And make no doubt about it, 
the name of the game at this point is economic isolation for Russia. These sanctions, even if President Putin were to be deposed today, even if the Russian forces were to pull out of Ukraine today, these sanctions will be in place for years to come. But again, a lot of what we're seeing today does go back to the question of how are you treating Russia? You know, I'll come into this in, in more detail later. You know, a lot of regulators are likely asking you that question either in your, your home countries or in the US. What are you doing with Russia? What is your risk appetite with Russia? Um, you know, it, it is a big question in terms of how companies are defining a risk appetite and more importantly, how they're monitoring. It. It, it's only good enough to have a risk appetite if you have data that can evidence that you're staying on the right side of it. I have some clients that are following the letter of the law and we will do whatever our clients ask so long as it's legal. I have some that have essentially stopped anything to do with Russia directly or indirectly. Um, and kind of everything in between. It really is a mixed bag across financial services. I, I even get questions from clients around, should we begin exploring investing in distressed Russian assets? I mean, it, this has become a really interesting time for the financial services industry, because again, no sector is better equipped to understand what is legal, what is not, and what to do about it uh, than financial services. And so you do have some businesses really trying to support their clients because again, the law doesn't say I, I have to leave. So, you know, again, just, just a reminder, feel free to interrupt with, with questions throughout. I'm not sure if I've missed any thus far, um, but wanna make sure this is as helpful to, to everyone involved as possible. Now, if we go to the next slide, thank you. Enforcement has been really low. Um, now, I think you all remember the eye-watering fines of the last decade. Those are done. With, with Unicredit, there are no more big bank stripping fines of that era. That was really, that was the end of those, of those era of cases. Now, enforcement has dropped somewhat significantly over the last few years. If you look at what the UK government has done, there has been one penalty issued this year for £36,000. There was one penalty issued in 2021 for 50,000 pounds. Thus far in the US, FS oriented fines are at $160,000, $170,000 in aggregate. Very low amount. In 2021, total OFAC enforcement resulted in just $20 million in OFAC oriented fines. And again, I'm classifying these as fines levied purely by OFAC, not any of the banking regulators. In 2020, it was 23 million. So enforcement is quite low. Um, I wouldn't take a ton of comfort from that um, because as we know, while OFAC is wildly understaffed um, and OFSI even more so, uh, these cases do ultimately find their, their way to the light of day. They, they do find that companies will be willing to sign tolling agreements uh, to ensure and extend the statute of limitations and enable, um, and enable some of these cases to really have the time they need to be settled. Now, it is important to note, and I know for years, governments, I was very guilty of this when I was in OFAC, would go out and, and threaten the financial services industry with big fines if you didn't comply with their sanctions. I think in the instance of the current Ukraine crisis and the sanctions on Russia, if you think about the scale of institutions, not just financial services, but all sectors operating in the market, I really do believe that enforcement will be limited for truly the most egregious cases, not an instance where there was a control failure or an analyst made the wrong decision or someone fat figured clearing a payment. Like these will be the companies that were knowingly going out of their way to violate these sanctions. I, I really don't believe one from a, a resourcing standpoint or just practically speaking, when you look at the volume of companies operating in the US, the volume of enforcement that people have to fear if they were at least trying to do the right thing. Now, as we all know, evidencing that you're doing the right thing is, is extremely important. Um, that, that really does not go without saying all of the activities that you're taking, enhancements to policies and procedures, training, systematic controls, uh, having served as an independent consultant for a Fed enforcement action last year, I, I can attest to what the Fed is looking for. If it's not documented, it doesn't exist. And, and that is kind of the principal rallying cry as you begin to look at, at some of these cases. Now, if we go to the next slide and, and kind of talk about what is 
what is really happening at this current state? One, you've got regulators that are taking notice um, and fairly significantly beginning to ask questions around how are you managing your sanctions risk? And it's not just the US, the FCA has done the same with banks operating in their jurisdiction and asking questions. I've seen, at least with one regulatory agency, essentially stripping down their AML exams for the remainder of 2022 to much more exclusively focus on sanctions related examinations. So a much deeper dive in looking at your sanctions compliance programs than we have seen in recent years. And that really is um, you know, kind of a testament to how important these issues have become uh, in our compliance organizations. Now, the other thing I'll, I'll note is that that earlier point that I mentioned around defining and, and monitoring Russia risk appetite. And, and for those of you on the line who, who don't have kind of a risk appetite posture um, with respect to Russia, I, I would heavily encourage you to establish one because your supervisors will likely be asking at some point, what are you going to do now again. There's some real ethical and reputational issues here. The law doesn't oblige most financial institutions to abandon ship, to abandon the Russian market. Now, you know, there are some literal operational challenges that I think are impacting risk appetite. I know of several global banks that have had that have operated legally in Russia up until recently um, and currently that had their correspondent relationships with US dollar clearing providers threatened for continuing to operate in Russia. So essentially can performing what is legal business in Russia um, was on the wrong side of the risk appetite of certain US domiciled institutions where they just didn't want to touch the risk anymore. And so threatening the US dollar clearing relationship for global firms relative to just the operations that were happening in Russia. Now, you've seen some firms who've obviously diversified using a variety of, of US dollar clearing providers kind of said, fine, unbank us, we'll use others. Others made the call, you know what, we're going to leave Russia. Um, and, and that is one of the, the bigger questions at this point, is that that point on risk appetite of how much risk are you willing to absorb and, and kind of how far does this really go? Now, again, I mentioned that you know, that that prior example of, kind of a, a real situation where kind of risk appetite meets reality, you're conducting legal business in Russia and your correspondent relationships are being threatened because you're doing something on the wrong side of one of your counterparties risk appetites. As you begin to look at, at some of your clients, not even your, yourselves, I mean, there's some real practical challenges that, that are going to continue to play out. I, I have an example of a client that's in the food ingredients business. And their packaging is sourced 100% from a company ultimately owned by a sanctioned oligarch. And so this company is faced with the choice. We have a manufacturing facility set up around the world that is 100% customized to this packaging that's provided to us. Um, and we're going to run out of it at some point, or we're going to run the risk of, of either retooling our factory or we're going to continue buying from these providers. And that is the, the question that you're seeing some companies faced with. Whether sanctioned or not, you're seeing businesses begin to weigh out that calculus, that calculus of supply chain resiliency. And that potentially needs to put you guys on higher alert for ensuring that you understand your clients, where they're operating, uh, what they're doing, who they're operating with, because as we know, indirect sanctions risk can be just as damaging as direct sanctions risk. Now, the next area that, that's kind of waiting to, to be seen is what happens with secondary sanctions. And, and secondary sanctions, you can argue whether or not they were effective during um, their use related to Iran. In this instance, the threat of secondary sanctions is almost acting, acting as a proxy for actually deploying secondary sanctions. We've been talking about the imposition of secondary sanctions potentially from a US standpoint since December. Secondary sanctions have not yet been imposed. I do think you're beginning to see 
certain countries, and you're seeing the Quad meet this week, uh, with Modi in particular being charmed by a number of Western governments, uh, of really beginning to remind countries that these powers have been established, where essentially, if you want to continue doing business with Russia, for instance, we may not allow you to do business with us. And so those secondary sanctions threats continue. And non-US companies are at risk of designations themselves if they're found to be providing material support to designated parties. Now, true to form, OFAC and the US government does not provide a very clear definition of what constitutes material support. It really is, to a certain extent, up to the government to determine based on some of these situations. But you know, right now, it has never been more important to have a clear link between your KYC program and your sanctions program to really understand the beneficial owners, board members, counterparties that you're dealing doing business with, and potentially understanding who your customers' customers are to really try and root out any potential activity that can put you on the wrong side of, of US sanctions. Because as we know, sanctions are still a strict liability regime with kind of a risk-based flavor at times. Um, and a violation, you know, whether knowingly or unknowingly, can still creep up. Um, so a question just came in, how does one manage, how, one is, how does one handle managed funds and Russian investors in those funds who already have investments in said funds? Um, now, and I'm assuming when you talk about Russian investors, you're referring to designated Russian investors, not just any Russian investors. So assuming that is the scenario and you can correct me, yeah, that's what I figured. Um, this is complicated. So a lot of this does end up depending on the percentage of ownership that that Russian investor has. Um, obviously, if they own the majority of the fund, that, that can create some additional complexities. I've seen scenarios of essentially divesting the assets of that investor, moving those funds into a, a separate blocked account to try and ring fence them from the rest of, of the fund. Now, there have been situations where you know, material investors in a fund can taint the overall fund. Um, so if the majority of investors in a specific fund are designated persons, then that does create complexities. As we know, multiple SDNs owning 50% or more of an entity make it a blocked entity. If it's a more immaterial portion, then you really do try and divest and bring fence the assets to keep them separately. Um, this is one of those areas that OFAC has struggled with. They've had limited securities expertise over the last few years. A lot of those people have left and gone to industry. Um, but these are some of those more nuanced case-by-case -case examples that the Treasury does try and work out. But you know, I, I've seen these scenarios play out both ways where there was enough of an investment from designated persons where the whole fund was considered blocked and where it was a small enough portion um, that you can move those assets and block them. I mean, you're not, you're obviously not giving the assets back to the investor at that point if you find that they're designated. I guess I'll take that moment to pause. Are there any other questions? I know I've gone through a bunch of things fast, so I want to make sure that, that I'm being responsive. It looks like we have a large group on the line, so I want to make sure that, that folks uh, weigh in accordingly. Again, you can chat or use the Q&A. And if you're participating only by phone, you can send an email um, to info at iib.org. We'll, we'll be watching that. So I guess kind of picking back up that indirect exposure point um, that I mentioned earlier, and just to, to spend a few minutes on, on what I'm seeing now uh, in this space, you're now beginning to see firms you know, not just look at, at their direct sanctions exposure, but they're probing their clients to understand where are their clients doing business, you know, potentially with Russian entities, in particular with Russian government entities. I have an investment management client, so the, the question on kind of the investors before, it's beginning to look at any link to India and understand what links do some of their Indian counterparties have to the Russian government and potentially preemptively divest um, in some of these investments and positions that they've taken. You're beginning to see more questions come up around that indirect risk. And we know there's a number of countries continuing to transact with Russia, China, India, the UAE is a great example. The Emiratis have, have clearly 
taken a position of, of not saying anything, but taking in Russian capital. So these are some of the things to be on the lookout for as you begin to probe your clients, as you talk to your groups around the world of understanding how are we beginning to look at our indirect exposure? Because again, if you find that you're ultimately financing, financing a transaction through your branch in New York that's related to a customer's customer's payment for business that's rendered from a blocked Russian entity, and even if you're a few steps removed, if that ultimately comes to light, you can be held liable. Um, and, and those are some of the things where ignorance is not necessarily a defense. Granted, there's a reasonable expectation of due diligence, but really trying to probe your indirect exposure. But I, I can't say this enough, really trying to figure out what is your position with Russia. You don't necessarily need to say it publicly. There's one bank that made a spectacular 180, who I will not name, going from one day saying that we are staying in Russia and 19 hours later saying we are leaving Russia. I mean, I think as we all know, those that are operating in Russia don't really talk about the fact that they're operating in Russia, because again, still very legal, and I'm not trying to to cast any any aspersions otherwise, but there's obviously that reputational damage that, that needs to be considered. And again, as banks, and I'll, ultimately I work for a firm that it's owned by an insurance broker, clients still are servicing legal activity. You still have trade related contracts. But as we begin to watch and play out of the next few months, assuming this doesn't end quickly, which I don't think there's any indication will, you're finding that shipping lines won't move goods to or from Russia. You're finding that insurance carriers won't cover or place cover for the vessels that are moving goods to or from Russia. You're finding banks that may be beginning to wind down their ability to finance any Russia-related activity. So your corporate clients will, over time, reduce any existing activity that they may have as these sanctions begin to take hold. I think you know, sanctions I've described previously as an economic missile. In, in this instance, it's almost like a patient that's going septic. It just takes time to really see these sanctions take root from what starts as a cut and then another cut that ultimately gets infected and, and has a more dramatic impact on the Russian economy. Given some of the media challenges that we see, it's really hard to tell. You see data coming out of Russia is that the ruble's doing great. I think most people find that extremely hard to believe at this point. But most of the sanctions that we're looking at, especially when you get into supply chain sanctions, take months to really bite. Um, and those are some of the things to look at as we begin to see going forward, kind of how these sanctions will play out. Now, I think China has served an, an interesting role in this current crisis. You saw in the earlier days um, of the invasion, fairly generic statements coming out of, of the Russian government um, now, or out of the Chinese government, excuse me, while at the same time seeing certain Chinese state-owned banks shy away from financing Russian-related activity. You've seen a number of Chinese consumer products companies leave the Russian market, much like some of the larger American businesses that have pulled anchor from Russia. So you, you are not necessarily seeing China provide the lifeline uh, that many would have expected initially, although there's obviously been a lot of public rhetoric from what I'm seeing on the ground, the activity, the actual commerce isn't necessarily reflecting um, material support. Now, as we begin to look, and I think it came out yesterday in the BBC, some of the footage of, of the alleged treatment of the Uyghur population in Xinjiang, still more potential sanctions looming related to Hong Kong autonomy, um, how Russia plays a role in further China sanctions is something to watch. We, we've obviously seen the Biden administration take a vastly different approach in how it's treating China. Um, you know, the, the Trump approach to China was very public, was very loud, didn't necessarily accomplish a whole lot. Um, the Biden administration has kind of adopted the tact of, of a lot of prior governments of, of not necessarily kicking up massive fusses in, unless there was real reason to do so. And so at this point, and I think the foreign minister of, of Ukraine even said it at Davos today, we don't need China to necessarily take a position that they're anti-Russia. We just don't need them to help that much. And, and that is kind of what you're beginning to see when you see businesses, companies companies 
governments voting with their feet, that material support isn't necessarily there. Now, one of the other big questions is what is left to sanction? Um, and again, to my earlier point, there is, there's a lot more that's been left unsanctioned than actually sanctioned to date. For one, you know, we still don't have a final plan from the EU on the treatment of Russian oil. One of the bigger questions is we don't have a definition of what is Russian oil? At what point, refined, unrefined, does it become Russian oil? Like these are some of the practical questions that need to be understood as these programs ultimately roll out. Again, secondary sanctions we haven't seen imposed. We saw just yesterday one of the greatest announcements of OFAC, that an announcement about nothing, the kind of announcement where essentially they stated that we are not going to do anything with respect to extending the date with which Russia can continue to pay their sovereign debt coupon payments that come due. And at 12.01 last night, that general license expired, that general license 9C expired. It is actually one of the first times in my career I can think of an announcement that OFAC put out that essentially said, we're not doing something. Um, so it kind of a Seinfeldian manner of, of approaching the situation. But obviously there were a lot of questions around what is the US going to do? And so now we wait for the next steps. I think the next coupon payment is due on June 24th. Um, you know, this is all viewed as a technical default. Russia has the assets, but will literally be unable to make good on these payments because those collecting them will not be able to receive them in dollars, even though Russia is saying today that they will attempt to pay in rubles, which fall outside of, of the contract. We are running out of easy sanctions, though. There's obviously more oligarchs that can be named for those keeping track. Roman Abramovich is still not sanctioned in the U.S., I mean, these are some of the questions that, that are unanswered, especially as it, it's become clear he's not so much an, an envoy for peace between Russia and Ukraine. Um, there's more oligarchs that can be sanctioned. I think we've all gotten over the, the fun of seeing yachts seized. That seems to have died down pretty quickly, yachts, aircrafts, and homes. Um, we saw an oligarch over the weekend, the National Crime Agency in the UK raided the home of Peter Avin, suspecting him of sanctions evasion. Um, Oleg Deripaska, there's been investigations ongoing for his potential ongoing sanctions evasion. But then you have sanctions, like, you have oligarchs like Patanin, who kind of own and really cornered the nickel market, who have essentially been deemed too big to sanction. And so there are questions of, of how long can some of these issues go on. When you begin to look at, at the practices around you know, continued trading in, in natural gas and in oil until that gets ultimately locked down, Unfortunately, the US is somewhat at a loss around how much it can do to really not inadvertently ensnare its allies around the world. Um, that is, you know, historically, the, the focus is obviously limiting the sanctions damage on the target, in this instance, the Russian government. However, the longer this plays out, the less concern there is for the Russian people at that point. But the US is focused on ensuring that it doesn't inadvertently ensnare its allies in, in some of these sanctions. If secondary sanctions do come about, um, you know, they will be kind of a sectoral secondary sanctions package where they'll be a lot more narrowly focused. They can't be like the secondary sanctions on Iran, which said you basically can't do anything with Iran if you want to do business with the US here. Because again, to my prior points, there's still a lot of commercial activity that's legally permissible. So you really need to build these secondary sanctions around the activity that has been explicitly banned. Um, and the others, you know, depending on where the sanctions go, potentially you know, are, are not covered. But there can be additional bans on selling certain products. There's already bans on, on selling technology-oriented products into Russia. Um, you know, that started in the beginning, but you've begun to see you've begun to see greater focus on some export oriented restrictions. Um, and, and I do think that is kind of one of those additional levers as Russia continued to become more and more of a global um, of a global provider. You've seen that reliance on goods and services from other countries. We, we've seen a ban on professional services, on accountancy services, on um, on, on public relations services from UK and American businesses. 
but again, um, you're you're seeing you're seeing more physical products that are are in scope. Now, the other thing to bear in mind is Russia isn't sitting idle. Idle. They've applied counter sanctions. I mean, there were decrees in the early days of the invasion that foreign investors are unable to divest in their businesses in Russia. Um, you know, I have had clients that have literally just mothballed their businesses in the country um, to the point where rather than shipping computers out of Russia, they were taking them and destroying them with hammers because they didn't even want to go through the exercise of, of moving goods. Some were literally just abandoning their businesses, and these are not insignificant companies. Others have gone about obviously making transactions to sell and divest to non-designated parties, but obviously losing a substantial amount of money relative to the value of those businesses pre-invasion. So it, it is a question to see the ease with which an exit can actually occur. But I think if you think about sanctions as a vice grip, there are still clicks left to be pulled. We haven't even talked about natural gas from a sanction standpoint. Um, and so, you know, that that are that is kind of one of the, the next big question marks, especially as we go towards the end of the summer, is what is the EU going to do um, in, in terms of its treatment of natural gas beyond the oil sanctions that it's focused on? You know, again, from an export standpoint in, in the U.S., you've seen license requirements on export controls applied to anything on the commerce control list bound for Russia and Belarus. Um, you've seen the luxury product bans. You've seen Russia counter and can try and limit the ability for the exportation of certain goods from them, although that will come at a cost to them, as obviously the exportation of certain precious metals, rare earth minerals, oil, natural gas, all of these things have helped continue to fund the operation uh, that Russia is carrying out uh, in Ukraine. So there are some calculus that Russia needs to begin to consider um, as it begins to look ahead. So I know we have some time left. I wanted to save room for questions, although seeing that folks haven't, haven't piled on, just to kind of open up again to see if, if anyone has any questions thus far. Hey, Dan, there's a question um, that came in about material support. So you had sort of mentioned that we haven't really seen a lot of enforcement action yet. The real focus has just been on designations and everything now. But the administration, you know, people from the administration have been sort of saying, pay attention, you know, about material support. Just wondered if you could talk about that a little bit more. So that it's it's a good question. You're right. I, I did promise to talk about that more. Um, the, the material support point and, and look, the, the, some of what you all have experienced over the last few weeks is straight out of the Stuart Levy playbook, who originated the, the Undersecretary of Terrorism and Financial Intelligence role, where the U.S. would travel around the world to essentially try and invoke the fear of God into companies for following in line with the US posture. The, the challenge here on the material support front is that material support issue is material support rendered to designated entities, gov Russian government officials, the Russian government. It's not material support more broadly to kind of any Russian businesses. So assuming you know who you're doing business with and you have a general idea of who your clients are doing business with and you're screening all of the right fields in payments um, and asking the right questions. You know, it, it is one of those challenges to watch out for. However, the controls that are traditionally used for sanction screening should be sufficient. But again, that's all dependent on the data that you have available to you. So to the question on material support, and again, there is no definition, at least explicitly of what constitutes material support, you really do, I mean, again, th this all goes back to the agenda. The U.S., its allies, want Western businesses out of Russia. We want to deprive the Russian people, the Russian government, access to Western capital, to Western goods and services. Like, it's not just Western. They, we want to isolate Russia from humanity. That is the view of the Biden administration. Again, the challenge in dramatically upping the ante on imposing some sanctions that enforce business that enforce the fact that businesses must leave is the loss events that some of these businesses may take. And that is the balancing act. 
We saw with, with GL13A that came out today, again, extending the ability for businesses to essentially make legal payments to operate in Russia. A lot of that, I imagine, is due to wind down related activities, although not explicitly stated. So, you know, again, those type of, of threats are, are reminders to continue to do your diligence. They're also veiled threats to remember you know, these governments don't want you or your clients doing business in the market. And so that is the question. While the sanctions don't say that, that is the, the kind of the pretext that they're really trying to push out. So I'm not sure, Bridget, if there were any other kind of thoughts around around that, but it, it's at least my two cents on the on the material yeah, support point. Yeah, that's helpful. Um, another question came in. Can you talk about ESG scores, including sanctions policy and programs? <sighs> it's a great idea. Um, I, I have not seen ESG scores actually begin to incorporate, at least explicitly, I, I've seen risk programs more broadly get kind of brought into the mix. Um, but no, I have not seen that yet. I, I think, and, and there's obviously been a lot of, of challenge to some of the, the measures of judgment of kind of ESG compliance over the last uh, few weeks, now, that is one to, to look out for. I, I do think it's it's more the ESG challenges relative to sanctions policy will be more at a reputational level than, than having any direct kind of impact on ratings, at least initially. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's kind of where I see that going. But it is coming up more and more as I talk to clients that have been challenged by activist investors of you say you have a strong ESG position, but you're still trading pretty actively with Russian counterparties. Like how, how does that jive? Um, so here's another question. What level of compliance or degree of collaboration do US banks have in applying UK and EU sanctions if they don't overlap with OFAC sanctions? And the example is Gazprom Bank. So that is a fantastic mm -hmm. question. It is something we're beginning to see more of. I am seeing more American banks leverage selectively some of the EU designations that are not replicated uh, in the US on the OFAC lists. Now, replicated in the sense of applying enhanced due diligence of additional tokens to look out for, but I am definitely seeing for the first time ever really you know, the EU is leading the way on designations around the world from a, a Russian sanction standpoint. So companies are applying those lists to their filters. They were obviously already doing that outside the US, but you're now seeing them use those lists more actively in the US. You know, obviously there's no blocking provisions in those scenarios, but those might be clients if they were challenged enough to find their way onto the EU sanctions list. Now, maybe we don't want to do business with them in the US, but EU sanctions have, have taken you know, this is a, they've never really taken center stage before. I mean, the concept of an EU sanctions attorney was not a thing three months ago. You had British attorneys who kind of understood EU sanctions, but that wasn't really a trade because of how immaterial the EU sanctions had historically been. And that really has all changed now with what we've seen over the last 10 weeks and in, in how these sanctions have evolved pretty significantly. So I am seeing it's a good practice incorporating UK and EU lists domestically in the US. Now, what you do with them, you obviously need to look closely so you don't make certain calls that might be overkill, but it's a really good question and a good practice to consider. Any? Last call for questions. If you can't tell, I could talk about this all day, although we've all been talking about this for the last few months, so everyone may be a little tired of it. Um, I think just kind of wrapping, you know, I think we put in the description, where will the situation go from here, which if I could figure that out, I'd play the lottery. Um, I mean, this is not ending anytime soon. Um, and I do think you know, to the prior points, there are more sanctions left to impose. Um, now, how this plays out, especially as you begin to look at other countries and their materiality of support uh, to Russia, that, that really is the next area of focus where I'm spending my time is, is not looking at that, direct, at that direct exposure, 
what that indirect exposure exposure for where regulators um, and enforcers are going next. And, and those questions are already being asked. So it is a, a really a good practice to begin to, to look into that preemptively. Well, Dan, I want to thank you again for spending time with us um, today and, you know, um, sharing your experience and insights and kind of predictions. <laughs> it's really helpful. And as always, you know, what's, what's especially helpful for the IIB is someone that really understands international financial institutions from the US side, as well as the home country side, because that's what, you know, is going on right now with these sanctions is, uh, is that um, complexity to the point of, of the question that you just answered. Um, so thank you for your time. Thank you for these materials. And thanks to the members that, that showed up today. Hope everyone has a great holiday weekend. Thank you. Thank you.